this is the fourth part of the lecture on concrete and uh, until now we have looked at the components that make up concrete, how they are put together and we looked at the mechanical uh, response, the properties that are important and now we will go on to look at the durability of concrete, what can happen to concrete over a long period of time, how degradation can occur and also we look at things that we have to do to ensure that the concrete structure has a long durable life. To start with here on the header slide, I have pictures of the Barcelona metro line 9 tunnel under construction and uh, here you have a tunnel going under the city of Barcelona and the lining is made of precast segments and this makes up the tunnel lining and a structure like this is supposed to last many years, at least 100 years, some say 200, 300 years. Similar structures, tunnel linings are being built in many cities all over the world. In India, we have a lot of projects under construction right now. So, let us see in this lecture what affects the durability, what can go wrong and how concrete microstructure and the reinforcement that is within the concrete can degrade under certain conditions and affect the durability of the structure. So, when we talk about durability of reinforced concrete, we know that the useful life of a concrete structure can be limited or hampered by damage resulting from two classes of phenomena. The deterioration of the concrete itself due to chemical reactions or physical phenomena within the material that is what can happen to the concrete itself and the other very important aspect and probably more important than the deterioration of the concrete is the corrosion of the steel reinforcement and as we know the steel reinforcement is very important for the mechanical uh, response of the reinforced concrete structure and if the steel corrodes it not only causes this loss of the tensile resisting capacity, but also can affect the concrete itself as we will see in the slides that follow. So, let us first look at what can happen to the concrete itself due to uh, chemical reactions and later on we will look at some physical phenomena that can affect concrete. To start with when we are talking about the deterioration due to chemical reactions, first we will talk about leaching. This is something that you might have observed when you look at concrete tanks, uh, walls of concrete, retaining structures and so on. When there is soft water that is in contact with concrete, this water can enter concrete dissolve the calcium hydroxide. This calcium hydroxide now reacts with the carbon, this calcium hydroxide now reacts with carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and can be deposited within or on the surface of the concrete as calcium carbonate and this is sometimes what we observe as white stains and white deposits on a concrete surface. Now, if this occurs for a short period of time and stops and does not continue further, generally there is not much to worry about. However, if there is extensive leaching that this continues for a long time and you see a build up of deposits, then we could consequently have a decrease in strength and this leaching leaves porosity that facilitates the ingress of other aggressive agents. A very important significant type of attack on concrete is that due to sulphates. Sulphates coming from ground water and soil again in contact with the concrete can react with the calcium hydroxide that is that has been formed in the hydrated cement paste due to the cement hydration reactions. Gypsum is formed from this reaction of sulphates and the calcium hydroxide. 
the gypsum reacts further with the hydrated compounds to give a tringite. In this process there is some expansion, so you can imagine that the interior of the concrete the part that is composed of the hydrated cement paste is expanding as the sulphate is reacting with the calcium hydroxide and the hydrated cement paste. This expansion results in cracking of the concrete, there is nothing that is resisting this expansion, the tensile capacity of the concrete is exceeded and we have cracks occurring all over the concrete that is reacting with the sulphates. In addition if we have magnesium sulphate that is attacking the concrete it is even worse. The magnesium hydroxide that is formed in this reaction due to the magnesium sulphate attack replaces the calcium ions in the calcium silicate hydrate gel with magnesium ions. Consequently the CSH loses its cementing effect, the bonding effect that is keeping concrete together is lost and the concrete not only cracks, but starts disintegrating very fast. So, this is something that we have to avoid by using a very impermeable concrete, cement that is better resistant to sulphate attack and ensuring that the concrete is made of good quality. Another aspect that comes about due to chemical reactions is carbonation. There is carbon dioxide in the air what we uh, mentioned when we discussed leaching. This carbon dioxide if it enters into the concrete starts reacting with the hydrated cement paste. Generally we find the surface zone of concrete undergoes carbonation. This carbonation is actually that of the hydrated cement paste. One very important consequence of the carbonation is that we find that the pH of the pore fluid of the concrete start starting from 12.6 can come down as low as 8 and later on we will see that when the pH drops below 11 we can have the depassivation of the steel leading to corrosion of the reinforcement. So, the change in pH due to carbonation is has very significant important effect in terms of the durability of concrete. Carbonation is such involves first the ingress of CO2, the carbon dioxide has to enter into the concrete and if there is a facility for it to enter then more carbonation occurs. Carbonic acid is formed, there is water present, the CO2 and water combine to give carbonic acid. This leads to the dissolution of the calcium hydroxide and CSH, some of it uh, comes out is lost dissolved, the rest deposits as calcium carbonate in the voids that are present, some of the bound water is also lost. In this process we have shrinkage occurring because of the dissolution and loss of water, we have carbonation induced shrinkage cracking and this can be important can be considerable at intermediate relative humidity say about 60 percent relative humidity. When the relative humidity is much less that the, the concrete is very dry, there is not enough water to facilitate the formation of the carbonic acid and the dissolution of the hydrated cement compounds. If the humidity is very high what happens is all the pores are now saturated with water and the carbon dioxide does not enter very easily into the pores because they are already filled with water. The significant carbonation induced shrinkage and consequently cracking occurs therefore in intermediate relative humidities say about 60 percent relative humidity. Other than the cement, other than the hydrated cement itself reacting with carbon dioxide and sulphates and so on, we can have a possibility that the hydrated cement paste reacts with the aggregates. 
generally aggregates are supposed to be inert they do not react they just filling up volume they giving strength and stability. So, we want to use materials which are inert as aggregates. However, we have cases where the alkalis in the cement can react with the silica from the aggregates. When we discussed the composition of cement we saw that there were oxides of sodium and potassium. These when the cement hydrates become hydroxides and they react with fine grain porous silica aggregates, aggregates which have fine bone fine grain aggregates which have fine grain silica can be prone to such reactions. The product of the reaction is the silicate gel that absorbs water that sucks up water and expands and in this process of expansion creates cracks. When all the pores are filled the further expansion causes the tensile strength to be uh, exceeded and cracks are caused. Subsequent to cracking the gel dries up the water evaporates the gel dries leaving open cracks and through these cracks now more water, water enters and the interior can suffer more and more of this cracking. This occurs only when silica is present in the aggregates. When we have something like silica fume, when we have very fine silica that is silica with very high surface area fineness or the concentration of the alkalis is very low, then the gel that is formed is non swelling and there is no damage to the concrete occurring. Just as we have alkali silica reactivity we can also have alkali carbonate reactivity where carbonate based aggregates can react with the alkalis. This happens in the case of dolomitic limestone where there is calcium carbonate and magnesium carbonate both present in the aggregates and these aggregates sometimes react with the alkalis resulting in loss of bond strength and micro cracking. So, this is also something that we have to be careful about when we choose aggregates to ensure that the aggregates do not have silica or reactive carbonates that can cause durability issues due to chemical reactivity. So, what we see when we look at chemical reactivity due to aggressive chemicals going into the concrete is that the entry of these chemicals is important affects the durability and this depends on several factors. The primary factor is permeability the ease with which water can flow into and through the concrete when we look at leaching when we look at sulphate attack and so on it all depends on water entering the concrete. So, permeability is very critical and this permeability is governed by the volume size and connectivity of the capillary pores. So, this is something that we have to remember that as long as we have very small capillary pores no capillary pores and no connectivity between the pores then permeability is very low the concrete becomes almost impermeable and water does not enter. Further the capillary pores can be decreased by decreasing the water cement ratio. So, we go back to what we discussed in terms of the composition low water cement ratio means we have to use a super plasticizer to ensure that there is workability and probably we have to complement the cement with a mineral admixture. Another very important aspect is curing bad curing even in a good concrete can lead to cracks due to improper hydration due to shrinkage thermal effects and so on we can have cracking if the concrete is not cured properly and this can affect the durability. So, low water cement ratio in the mixed design good extended curing for long period of time lowers the permeability and we have 
a more impermeable concrete. And as I said addition of a pozzolanic mineral admixture such as fly ash or silica fume also decreases the permeability. We use up the calcium hydroxide to create more CSH this fills up the microstructure there is a discontinuous pore structure and again the permeability decreases and we have a more compact concrete microstructure. The chemical reactivity also depends on other aspects we saw that carbon dioxide can enter leading to carbonation. So, the diffusion of ions and gases through the empty pores and the pore solution is important when we want to stop the entry of aggressive chemicals. Here again water cement ratio and curing are important low water cement ratio good prompt extended curing will decrease the possibility of ions and gases entering into the concrete. Thirdly and very important we have to avoid cracking we can have a very compact concrete very high strength concrete good quality concrete but if it cracks it facilitates the entry of water and anything else to enter into the concrete. So, cracking at all costs should be limited the widths of the crack should be minimized and we should avoid cracking at early stages due to pure curing due to shrinkage and so on. So, these are aspects which affect the entry of chemicals into the concrete which further lead to the chemical reactivity that we talked about. What are some of the physical effects that can lead to deterioration in the concrete or degradation of the concrete. We have freeze we have frost or freeze thaw attack that is cycles of freezing and thawing can damage the concrete very aggressive temperatures say what happens in a fire can also affect concrete the concrete can degrade when the temperatures are very high over a long period of time lower temperatures cycling or large gradients of temperature can also lead to cracking. Then we have already talked about shrinkage shrinkage stresses can also lead to cracking and as we just discussed all sorts of cracking is bad for concrete and we find that uh, thermal gradients and cycles can lead to cracks. And this is something that we have to avoid. So, let us look at first what happens during freezing and thawing and how it can be prevented in concrete. When we have the temperature of concrete dropping as we go below 0 degrees Celsius not all water freezes immediately. First the water in the large pores large air voids could freeze then the temperature has to keep on going down for further freezing to occur. So, this means that as the temperature is dropping the water has some mobility still and it is expanding at different points in time water in very small pores will need lower temperatures to freeze for example, water in a 10 nanometer pore will not freeze until the temperature reaches minus 5 degrees. Gel water in the scale of nanometers or even less will not freeze until minus 78 degrees Celsius that is practically gel water may not freeze at all in many cases. So, we find that this water at very low temperatures now is moving in, in the capillaries and has some mobility and this can lead to high pressures and this repeatedly occurring due to freezing and thawing can lead to degradation of the concrete due to cracking occurring in the microstructure. As the water freezes it dilates it expands and it compresses the remaining water so that water is pushed and this compression of the water and the movement of water creates pressure 
in the capillary porosity. If there is a large void, if there is an air bubble, then the water goes into these voids and air bubbles and the pressure is relieved. If there is no such void available and we only have capillary porosity through which this water is now compressed and moving, the pressure builds up and can lead to rupture that they can be cracking in the microstructure and finally, disintegration of the concrete. So, what do we do? We use in such cases an air entrained concrete, concrete that we intentionally put in some air. Generally, we would like concrete to be very compact without any air bubbles, but we understand that for resisting this frost attack, for having better freeze thaw resistance, we have to have some amount of air in the concrete. These microscopic distributed bubbles now relieve the pressure and prevent damage from occurring. This air entrainment can be achieved by a chemical admixture, we have talked about it before, we will also uh, mention it in the next slide. When you have air entraining, air entrained concrete, when you have air entrained concrete, so instead of the dilation coming out because of this expansion within, there is now contraction when freezing occurs. So, an air entraining admixture that can be put into the concrete to produce these microscopic air bubbles is called a surfactant, which is affecting the surface tension of the interface between the cement, the pore fluid and air. As a consequence, we have air bubbles that are dispersed through the cement paste and we have these stable air bubbles present in the fresh cement paste and also in the hydrated cement paste. So, this is some nice pictures from Mehta and Montero, where they show how we can have these capillary porosity, ice now forms and compresses the water and if the water does not reach a air void, then it could cause disintegration of the concrete around it. However, if there is an air void nearby, then the water is pushed into the air void and it expands here without much restriction and does not give rise to high pressure. This is a very nice picture of uh, a microscope image of ice having formed within an air void. This is a air void, we see a magnified image of an air void, this is the surface, this is now the hydrated cement paste and we see ice formation. So, this is ideal, there is no pressure build up due to this ice as there is a lot of space for the ice to form. So, this is what is achieved with an air entraining admixture. The results of air entrainment is that we get a finely distributed uniform set of voids in the hydrated concrete, in the hardened concrete. If there are now enough small voids, then the concrete is protected from freeze thaw damage because there is enough space where the ice can expand. We expect the spacing factor that is the distance between these microscopic bubbles to be less than 0.2 millimeters. The volume of air that has to be entrained for optimum protection is about 9 percent in the cement mortar. The cement mortar should have about 9 percent of air for proper protection against freeze thaw durability. If we have excessive air entrainment, then it does not help. There is porosity created, permeability increased and the durability actually drops. So, we should know what is the right amount of air to be put in, there are guidelines and one thumb rule is it that it should be about 9 percent of the mortar. Another advantage of air entrainment is that workability increases, you have these air bubbles now facilitating the flow, the segregation, the cohesion 
it also improves there is less segregation and the concrete becomes more cohesive. On the other hand we should realize that if we are putting air into the concrete we are increasing the porosity and therefore the strength would decrease and we find that the strength of concrete generally de decreases by about 5 percent for every 1 percent increase in the air content. So, it does not give us a lot of benefits if we put in a lot of air we have to know what is the optimum amount of air to get the most resistance to freeze thaw without affecting the durability and the strength. Let us quickly see what happens in the case of a fire in concrete. Generally concrete has good fire resistance, it does not burn, it does not disintegrate very easily. Nevertheless, the strength of concrete starts decreasing when temperatures go beyond 200 degrees Celsius, especially when this temperature is maintained for a long period of time. Short periods of time only may be the surface, the skin is affected because concrete is a poor conductor heat does not travel very much into the concrete. Concrete starts to degrade significantly when temperatures go beyond 500 degrees Celsius and it is maintained again for a long period of time. The CSH gel starts to degrade decompose at 120 degrees Celsius with loss of water some of the water is lost. However, not all decomposition occurs at such low temperatures only when the temperature exceeds 900 degrees Celsius that the CSH is completely decomposed. The Portlandite the calcium hydroxide decomposes between 450 to 550 degrees Celsius and the carbonates present decompose between 600 to 800 degrees Celsius. So, if we find that there is some degradation that starts at 120 degrees Celsius, but most of the degradation occurs beyond 400 or 500 degrees Celsius. So, that is why concrete degrades significantly only when temperatures exceed 500 degrees Celsius. The aggregates can also decompose depending on the type of aggregates when there is uh, very high temperatures cycling of temperatures depending on the size of the aggregates the porosity permeability we can have problems. Generally aggregates of low porosity which are compact dense are less susceptible. So, lower porosity aggregates are less susceptible to fire action within the concrete. So, if you have very porous aggregates then there is a possibility that these aggregates can crack in a fire. In general however, we can say that concrete maintains its integrity and very importantly provides sufficient protection for the reinforcement because the steel can also buckle can become soft lose its stiffness at high temperatures. Since the concrete has a low thermal conductivity and high specific heat it protects the steel during fire until it is disintegrated or cracked or spalled off. Such spalling can occur for example, in very high strength concrete. High strength concrete is something that is very compact does not have interconnected porosity it has very little water in a compact dense microstructure. So, in such concrete when temperatures increase the water that is present becomes vapor and in this process builds pressure. So, water becomes water vapor and the pressure builds and when if the pressure build up is so high and the water vapor cannot escape and this is difficult now in high strength concrete because you have low permeability there is no interconnected porosity the wa water vapor expands cannot escape and when the concrete is under compressive stresses spalling occurs. And 
what happens in spalling is that the cover of the concrete generally falls off spalls off exposing the reinforcement to the heat of the fire. This can result in creep buckling of the steel and possible collapse of the structure because the steel is not resisting loads anymore and the concrete has also lost some of its section. So, the concrete spalls off eventually and steel is exposed leading to collapse. One way to prevent this from occurring and what has become quite popular is the use of polypropylene fibers. These fibers melt at high temperatures and leave pores through which the water vapor now can escape. So, this is like a safety valve as the pressure builds up these polypropylene fibers now melt due to the high temperature and facilitate the escape of the water vapor and therefore, the pressure is dissipated. It does not resist the fire or it does not increase the strength or anything like that. It creates porosity through which now the water vapor can escape. The structural integrity is maintained there is no collapse which can lead to loss of lives or property and after a fire always the lining can be repaired and we do not have a major collapse that could have occurred. In terms of physical phenomena that can cause problems in concrete for completeness we also look have to look at the effect of thermal cycling and shrinkage. Shrinkage is something that we have discussed earlier when we have thermal gradients that is there is a drastic change in temperature as we go into the concrete at the surface we will have what is close to the ambient temperature in the inside because of the hydration reactions we can have very high temperatures inside. This can lead to thermal gradients and also due to environmental changes we can have cycling of temperatures during the day during different seasons of the year this repeated contraction expansion can also lead to cracking. So, thermal gradients and cycling of temperature can lead to cracks on the exposed concrete surfaces. Similarly, we can have surface cracking when there is shrinkage and this shrinkage is restrained. When the shrinkage is free from restraint like if you take a cube of concrete and leave it outside in a dry environment and let it dry it is not going to crack or fall apart because there is not much restraining the shrinkage. However, when shrinkage is restrained by the surroundings of a concrete element say in a pavement the sub base will restrain the concrete from shrinking. You can have other elements in the structural system which can restrain reinforcement offers some restraint and so on the concrete can crack due to this restraint because the restraint gives rise to stresses when the stress is more than the tensile strength then cracking occurs. This is something that we discussed in the previous part of this lecture. Whenever we have cracks they it facilitates the entry of water aggressive chemicals leading to degradation that we saw due to other physical phenomena and chemical action. So, these are the different types of chemical and physical actions that can degrade the concrete matrix in a structure. Now, let us see what happens to the corrosion of the reinforcing steel bars within the concrete. Most concrete structures will have reinforcement and this could be prone to, re to corrosion and we have to protect it. When we looked at metals we saw the reasons why corrosion occurs it is more stable for a material to oxidize to corrode it goes back to its natural state, but we have to use it within concrete in the form of steel in the uncorroded form and therefore, we would like to pre prevent corrosion from occurring. As we know corrosion involves the formation of a cathode and an anode it is an electrochemical process there is an electrical current that is formed and here now 
since since steel is embedded in the concrete the concrete also participates in the corrosion if at all it occurs at the anode we have seen that iron is oxidized into iron cations fe2 ions which now dissolve in the surrounding solution at a distance cathodic reactions are occurring with the consumption of the electrons released and the formation of the oh minus ions for the cathodic reaction to occur moisture must be present and there should be a supply of oxygen so this is very important remember that this in our context is occurring within concrete concrete has moisture to some extent and there could be moisture entering from the environment into the concrete if oxygen also enters then there are conditions which are ideal for a cathodic reaction and there could be corrosion the ions formed at the cathode and anode now can migrate through the aqueous solution present in the pores of the surrounding concrete if it is possible for the ions to migrate very easily again corrosion can occur more easily if we can prevent the migration the resistivity is very high the porosity is not continuous then again corrosion will be reduced so this is a nice picture from young et al showing how the process occurs we have an anode where the iron is dissolving this can start depositing somewhere else and we have a cathode which is consuming oxygen and water and this now forms a cell there is an electrochemical reaction the ions now are moving through the concrete and through the steel this is the concrete cover through which now oxygen and water can enter from the outside so if this is such that the concrete cover is such that it does not allow oxygen and water to enter then we prevent moisture and oxygen from reaching the steel and therefore we will have less possibility of this cathodic reactions to occur and corrosion to occur so the parameters controlling the corrosion rate are the properties of the concrete cover this is very important to understand when we talk about structural design generally we ignore what happens in the cover however for the case of a life of a structure the concrete cover is very very important because this is what is preventing the steel from corroding and protecting the steel the ability of the concrete cover to cut off diffusion of oxygen is very important we should not allow oxygen to enter slow down the diffusion of oxygen then we get better protection for the steel also we find that for the electrochemical reactions to occur the ions have to move and the elect the electrons also have to move from the anode to the cathode and so on and this depends on the resistance offered by the concrete if the concrete is dry the resistance is very high then there is less facility for this mobility of the ions and the electrons and we find that the corrosion is slower if there is a lot of porosity the porosity is connected there is a lot of water which is facilitating the electrochemical reactions to occur then corrosion happens faster so we want a concrete with a very high resistivity that means it's dry less porosity and we want oxygen to be cut off so that it does not reach the cathode so as we saw the there is this pore cell solution which is interacting and we have the formation of iron oxide or rust this has two consequences one is that the rust is expansive the volume change of rust is about 2 to 6 times that of steel that is the volume of rust has a 
the volume of rust is about 2 to 6 times that of steel. This means that rust within the concrete in the interface between the steel and the concrete is expanding. This leads to high pressures at the interface resulting in cracking and spalling of the cover and cracking of the concrete completely. So, this expansion created by the rust is one problem. The other obvious problem is as the iron is being dissolved there is a reduction of the cross section and the cross section will eventually reach a point that there is not enough steel to resist the tension and therefore, there is failure of the structure. So, these are the two effects of corrosion that could have grave consequences in a reinforced concrete structure. What protects this is the high pH of concrete about 12 which is sufficient to maintain the steel in a passivated state. So, in general in good concrete the steel is protected, there is a formation of a stable protective iron oxide film on the steel, this prevents for the further corrosion oxidation from occurring and only when this steel is depassivated, the iron oxide layer is lost and this occurs when chlorides enter and when the pH drops until then there is sufficient corrosion protection to the steel. Depassivation occurs mainly under two cases, we have calcium hydroxide being carbonated due to carbonation and the pH drops lower than 11, we saw that it can go down up to 8. Then we have chloride ions that are entering say from salts in the environment even if the pH is high, if chloride ions are more than 0.2 to 0.4 percent of the concrete, then we can have depassivation of the concrete consequently depassivation of the steel layer, steel oxide layer and we have no passivation of the steel. And as we said moisture and oxygen are necessary for corrosion to occur and therefore, we should avoid porous concrete and cracks. If we have porous concrete and cracks, we permit the ingress of water and oxygen and promote corrosion. We mentioned cracks, cracks are also very critical in terms of reinforcement corrosion. When we have cracks in the concrete, and this could come about because of bad construction practices, improper curing, shrinkage. We can have three very important effects on the corrosion. First of all, if there is a crack, it facilitates access by deteriorating agents like chloride ions, water, carbon dioxide, oxygen and so on. Cracks will therefore, accelerate the rate of corrosion because oxygen now is very easily available for the cathodic reaction together with the facility with which water can go in, chlorides can go in, carbon dioxide can go in. Now, oxygen can also enter and we have corrosion occurring very easily. The third effect is that there is a non-uniformity in the physical and the chemical environment around the steel due to the cracks and this promotes corrosion. The ease at which anodes and cathodes can form depends on the non-uniformity. If everything is uniform, then it is more difficult for one zone to become a cathode and the other to become an anode, but cracks provide non-uniformity, help in this non-uniformity and therefore, we can have higher facility for corrosion. So, these are the different things that affect corrosion, corrosion of the reinforcement and that is very important to prevent the durability of the structure being lost. So, this is a nice summary of the aspects related to durability that I have gotten from my colleague Professor Matthews, which tells us that concrete can be attacked and what is critical to the concrete is basically uh, the permeability which should be low 
and if we have problems of permeability then chlorides can get into the concrete oxygen can get into the concrete salt water carbon dioxide leading to carbonation and water can saturate the concrete leading to leaching and so on. On the other hand we want a proper mixed composition if the mixed composition is not adequate to the environment in which concrete is placed we can have issues like alkali silica reactivity due to alkali in the cement and silica in the aggregates. We can also have sulphate attack if now the hydrated cement base is prone to such attack. So, permeability and mixed composition are aspects that we have to remember when we have to look at durability of structures. If we have high permeability we can have all these effects leading to corrosion of the steel. If we have a poor mix design we have taken components that are not adequate to each other then we can have reactivity such as alkali aggregate reaction. If we allow water to penetrate a lot and go out of the concrete then we have leaching. If again due to improper mix composition we have sulphate attack we can have degradation of the concrete due to expansion cracking consequently occurs degradation occurs and that can lead not only to cracking but also to strength loss. So, what is very important to understand is that the proper mix design choice of the components and low water cement ratio can facilitate reactivity from being less and permeability from going very high low permeability always helps us in terms of durability. Some very interesting findings from uh, the Queen's University of Belfast in UK work of Bashir and Barbuya shows different causes of deterioration. What they have found from this study in the United Kingdom is abrasion leads to about 10 percent of deterioration similar alkali aggregate reactivity in India we do not have much problems of alkali aggregate reactivity we have good granite aggregates basalt aggregates in most places and this does not cause such problems, but in other countries this could be important. Chemical attack in harsh environments in factories and so on you could have chemical attack corrosion due to carbonation is always significant carbon dioxide is always present it seems to be going up in many urban environments and carbon dioxide going into the concrete can lead to carbonation and shrinkage. External chlorides due to sea salts and other salts can cause a lot of problems here in this case 33 percent was found in this study due to have uh, due to be due, due to 33 percent of the cases of deterioration were attributed to external chlorides. Sometimes water that is used in the concrete accidentally is salty sand has some salts. So, they could be internal chlorides inbuilt into the system which can cause problems freezing and thawing shrinkage and so on. Again freezing and thawing in most of India is not an issue, but in the north in the Himalayan regions this could be a problem. So, these are the different causes of deterioration that can occur in concrete and the relative importance of each of these phenomena that we have discussed in the previous slides. Now, why does this occur most of the time this again is from the same study by Bashir and it shows that lot of the problems are due to low cover absence of cover or inadequate cover they found that 20 percent of the causes of deterioration can be attributed to low cover and this is something that I think is true all over the world. Other aspect very important is poor quality concrete they found that about one fourth of the problems are due to poor quality concrete we talked about bad curing shrinkage and composition. So, poor quality is very very important poor design detailing 
that is it is not clear where the steel should be placed and this could again lead to problems of improper cover and bad design execution on the site. Poor workmanship is again related people not used to doing a good job can cause defects in the concrete and this could lead to problems. Wrong specifications the designer is not aware of the specifications that are appropriate for a certain structure. Joints waterproofing this is something that we will deal with in one of the guest lectures if water can enter into the concrete through joints to cracks and so on we can have further problems. Wrong material selection we use an inappropriate material just like design could lead to wrong specifications material component choice could also lead to durability issues. So, this is a very important uh, chart showing how improper design improper execution improper choices can lead to deterioration. To conclude if we want to increase the durability of concrete if we want to make concrete better we need to have proper mix design choice of the component should be proper and the concrete should have a low water cement ratio and should be compact. Cracking should be reduced at all costs cracking coming from shrinkage improper curing excessive loads should be limited crack width should be as small as possible crack should be avoided as much as possible. The cover is what is protecting the steel and this should be optimum it does not mean that the cover should be very high then the cover will crack because it is unreinforced concrete. The cover should be optimum good enough to prevent oxygen chlorides carbonation from reaching the steel, but not excessive that it cracks by itself. In terms of construction compaction is very important removal of the voids pores and curing if this is not done shrinkage and other sources of cracking can occur and we can have a crack concrete a porous concrete. Quality of construction should be as high as possible if we want a durable concrete we have talked in the previous lectures about structures which have to uh, last 100 years we have to have a high quality construction only then we will have high durability. Maintenance is also important it is not just the initial construction concrete structures need some care there should be regular inspection and checking and action taken to mitigate effects that could decrease the durability of the concrete structure. So, we have looked until now at the components of concrete the mechanical performance and the durability we will have one more part to this lecture we will look at special concretes and uh, with this you will have a big picture of concrete as well as details of some of the aspects related to the use of concrete in modern structures. Thank you.